My name is Chris Griffin, and once again, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome in uh, to the studio the co-director of the Extreme Gravity Institute, Nico Humes. <sighs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. You just informed me this. Is this a new uh, position for you to become, in addition to your teaching at MSU of Physics, uh, to become one of three uh, co-directors of the Extreme Gravity Institute? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I got to Montana uh, about four years ago. Uh, I was hired as a professor, as an assistant professor, and I'm still an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. uh, but about a year and a half ago, about a year ago, we started thinking with a, with a couple of colleagues wouldn't it be great to create an institute in Montana that studies black holes and neutron stars and supernovae and all the awesome things we get to see every day in Montana when we just look up in the sky and it's nighttime because we have an amazing night sky here. And uh, it took a long time to you know get the ball rolling and uh, get all the paperwork uh, done and get uh, the administration at the university was immediately behind us. But eventually, this is an official institute, so it had to be approved by the Board of Regents. Mm -hmm. And uh, that took a bit longer and finally got approved in this last Board uh, of Regents meeting. So, so now we're official. We're the only institute in the Northwest <laughs> that studies and focuses on, on black holes and neutron stars. This is very exciting. And that's all part of extreme gravity. Not just gravity, but extreme yeah. gravity. And, you know, we, we spell it E capital X. Extreme, you know, like <laughs> like an extreme sport. <laughs> exactly. Well, and you know what? Looking at some, because discussing time, I started looking at some equations, mm. and I had no idea what I was looking at. <laughs> because the math is intimidating. And this is why I, I, I find it uh, enjoyable to have you come in, because last week we discovered, you explained that gravity is a force. But in the very near future, we might find out it's maybe a wave. But it is a force. Even with a wave, it's still a force. Yeah, yeah. Gravity waves a little bit every now and then. But right. it's mostly a force. But, you know, let's let's go get back to your uh, intimidation about equations. Like, yes. Have you ever picked up a newspaper in France? Yes, I have. Okay. And have you not been intimidated by the fact that you couldn't really... I hope you don't speak French. No. Or read French. <laughs> no. Uh, see, I have eight years of Latin. So when I would okay. sit down with a French newspaper when I was in Paris uh, and uh, Mont Saint Michel, uh -huh. um, I would grab the newspaper and highlight all the words I, that I recognized. Really? <laughs> So and then try to figure out the story from there. Okay, there you go. See, but that didn't intimidate you, and yet it was a language you didn't understand. With mathematics, it's the same. Once you like get the basics, mm -hmm. you can begin to understand what other people are saying. We shouldn't be intimidated because you can't speak what the language other people speak. I I believe you're absolutely correct. It we just just need a translator. Yeah. That's all you need, <laughs> or a little more schooling. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. <laughs> the topic of conversation I wanted to uh, have a, a discussion with you about today is time. Because obviously, uh, gravity we talked about last week, time is also another important element of physics. And I've described time, and I sent this to you in the email last night, that I can describe time as not now. Because it's either then in the future or it's then in the past. <laughs> that's right. And that's a very philosophical definition of time. <laughs> but does that function in the world of physics? Well, yeah, you know, time is a very complicated topic. So philosophers and uh, religious uh, people that study religion and physicists and chemists and scientists in general have debated, well, like, what is time? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no consensus. It really depends on on what you're doing with time and what do you want time to represent. So, for example, you may or may not know that um, in a previous life, I was a piano player. And wow. I practiced piano for about 10 years. And for a piano player, time is super important. We call it tempo. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep the tempo steady in your piece most of the time so that it doesn't feel like you're rushing it or it doesn't feel like you're slowing it down necessarily. Um, and And... For us, for, for musicians, um, now I'm a musician, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, they, I, one thing you don't know is that once upon a time in my life, I was a bass player. Well, there you go. So I understand uh, this. the same language. <laughs> so the first thing I was taught is that there was this little machine called a metronomo, in Spanish, a metronome, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, which was this like little rod, this little steel rod that just oscillated from side to side. It was attached at one end, a plastic base, and just oscillated back and forth, and every time it oscillated, it clicked. It went click, clock, click, 
clock, click, clock. And it did so at a very steady rate. And as uh, an apprentice musician, this was very important because it allowed me to keep my tempo, to know what the right timing of the playing of the notes was. Eventually, you don't need the metronome anymore, and you keep this metronome in your head. It just ticks with you. Uh, but as a musician, I could like slow time down, and I could speed it up. And I thought this was fascinating, right? <laughs> uh, so for a musician, time is what a metronome measures. Mm -hmm. Okay. For a scientist, time is what clocks measure. Mm. That's the definition of time. Okay. If you want, it's the, it's the measure that allows you to calculate the duration between events. It's, it's the thing that allows you to order events, to say what came when, like did something happen before something else, mm -hmm. is what allows you to construct cause and effect. Okay. Mm -hmm. And anything... So if I, if I tell you, this, we call it an operational definition in, in philosophy, I guess. Um, when I say time is what clocks measure, then the next obvious question is, what is a clock, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. So a clock is something that keeps track of repetitive motion, that counts repetitive motion. We call it periodic motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Think of a, of a clock, you know, what, what's, what's, the, what's the, 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 the first image that you have of a clock when, well, when you're the, growing up? The standard, you know, uh, 12 through, uh, 12, 1, 2, 3, all the way around uh, going uh, clockwise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, all the way around, but uh, with all the numbers represented. Okay, but um, physically, in you know, when minutes. I was growing up in Argentina, so my, my son of a Spanish immigrants, okay, and mm -hmm. my, my grandfather was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And he had, I remember, like we were yesterday, this grandfather clock, which was awesome. It was this piece of furniture that was you know, two meters, so six feet tall, okay, made of wood, beautiful, and it had this very long rod. Uh, I think it was a uh, copper rod that just oscillated back and forth. And went, the pendulum operating as a metronome. It was a pendulum. <laughs> it was an upside down metronome. Exactly. <laughs> and it could keep time because it counted, it kept track of every oscillation of the pendulum. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is how a grandfather clock works. Okay. It keeps time by measuring how many times the pendulum is going back and forth. And it knows internally how many times the pendulum has to go back and forth for one of the little hands to move by one minute. And that's essentially how a grandfather clock works. And it's done with, you know, um, uh, all sorts of internal um, gears and, gears and, and offsets. Like well, so hold on. Uh, Time is what a clock measures. And using your example of the grandfather clock mm -hmm. with a swinging pendulum, mm -hmm. time is the manifestation of gravity or a manifestation of gravity because that pendulum swings because of gravity. Well, for that particular clock, uh, clock that's correct. Okay. Um, but, you know, there are other clocks that don't need gravity because I can make an electrical current oscillate back and forth. Okay. Okay. I don't need a pendulum to be moving back and forth. I can just make electrons, electricity go back and forth in a circuit. And if I can keep track of the oscillations of this electricity, I can then know how many times it has to go back and forth for the little clock hand, mm -hmm. if you want, in the electric oscillator to advance by one minute or by one second. And that's the basis of an, an electric watch, effectively. Or... My your cell phone because I don't... or a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think your cell phones uh, now today's cell phones are probably synchronized uh, via the internet with like the the I atomic think, clock in with, Boulder, which then brings me to the most precise clocks we have produced. These are atomic clocks, mm -hmm. and it turns out that when you put atoms in uh, the presence of or you shoot them with uh, radio waves, okay. Mm -hmm just like the radio waves you are emitting right now uh, in the radio, then these atoms, the electrons in the nucleus of these atoms can uh, jump back and forth in their energy levels, we call them. So they get excited because they got a radio wave and then they de-excite themselves by emitting a, a light particle of photon. So they, they get hit by radio waves and they get all excited 
and then they relax down, emitting a photon. And this excitation and relaxation, excitation and relaxation happens at a frequency that's very, very precise, and it's completely determined by the structures of the nucleus and the structure of the atom. Um, so if you can keep track of these oscillations of the electrons up and down, up and down, and up and down, mm -hmm. then you can use that as a clock. And it turns <laughs> out that cesium, for example, can oscillate 9,192,631,770 times per second. Okay. okay. And that's, in fact, how, until the 90, 1994, that's how a second was defined. It was defined as a cesium atom oscillating 9,182,631,770 times. How cool is that? that that's, <laughs> well, well, first of all, it's, it's very cool that somebody realized that that was the exact length of a second. Secondly, that we had instruments that were able to measure that many oscillations that happened within a side of a second. How cool is that? And you're welcome uh, as part of physicists. Uh, physics. Physics says you're welcome. <laughs> It's 1450 KMMS, 1340 KPRK, having a conversation with physicist and co-director of the Extreme Gravity Institute, Nico Younes. But we left off with the measuring of time in cesium at uh, all those oscillations, and that is the actual definition of one second. I've been reading that parallel universes are possible. <laughs> from my basic and i don't want to muddy the waters too too deep but through string theory alternate universes are possible and in some universes time will actually run in both directions yeah uh, <laughs> okay um okay so so yeah so there's this thing called string theory mm -hmm. and it's a it's um it's a theory that attempts to um unify, if you want, gravity and quantum mechanics. And mm -hmm. it's one possibility out there. There's others that are perhaps a bit less popular. But string theory is super cool from a mathematical point of view. So if you, if you know a lot of mathematics, and I am not claiming that I... I'm one of those people. Nor, <laughs> nor am I, nor am I, sir. Yeah, but I can read the, the, the executive some, summaries. There are some people in this universe on Earth that really appreciate the mathematical elegance of string theory. Mm -hmm. And one of the recent um, predictions, or if you want, one of the recent results that have come out of, of the camp of string theory is that indeed... Um, They've been trying to understand why is it that the constants of nature, okay, you know, um, Newton's constant of Boltzmann's constant, these constants that appear in the laws of physics, okay, in the equations of physics, and they just take, you know, as I said, a constant value. Why do they take the constant value they take? Why aren't they different? Um, and um, there has been a lot of debate about that. I mean, there has been calculations that have argued that, well, if they were a little bit if they were actually different from what they are by a some amount, then life on Earth, for example, would not have originated because um, gravity would have been too strong or the electromagnetic force would not have been strong enough or whatever. Okay, So one of the possibilities that string theory has contemplated is that, in fact, we are just one universe in a plethora of universes. 10 to the 120-something universes. And each universe has a different has different values for these constants of nature. Okay? And the laws of physics, therefore, operate differently in these different universes. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want, you can think of this as a... Um, as, as, a, as a road with lots of little uh, potholes. Okay? Okay. I, I'm uh, okay. following you. Imagine a road, and not in Bozeman, of course, because we don't have a lot of potholes. Right. But, you know, in Buenos Aires, where I come from, our streets have a lot of potholes. Okay? So imagine a road with lots of potholes, and each, inside of each pothole, there's a universe. Okay? Okay. And each universe has its own set of constants and its own set of people and whatever, okay? And mm -hmm. then there's another, if you want, universe in another pothole with a different set of constants and different laws of physics. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have any people or beings, whatever mm -hmm. they are, because, you know, the laws of physics don't allow it. Maybe everything is too hot or whatever, okay? The caveat, though, is that the, 
universe in one pothole cannot really communicate with the universe in another pothole. And if there's no communication, there's no way to verify that there is another pothole. So, yes, in theory, this could exist. And string theory suggests that perhaps this is uh, something that could be happening. But there's no real way, at least not as of now, to test this prediction. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of physicists out there uh, cringe a little bit whenever somebody makes a prediction that can't be tested. Because after all, that's what we should be doing. <laughs> there's many possible realities but the one that matters is the one we live in. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, of course it does. Physics can explain so much, yet not all the way back to the Big Bang. Or you can get as close as you can to a black hole until you get to the singularity and then things start to fall apart. Why is physics important and how does it affect my life? Because it explains the majority of things, but it's not the be-all and uh, end-all of everything. Well, right. I mean... We don't know everything, and, and that's great. If we knew everything, then we would be done. Life would be so boring. There would be nothing else to understand, nothing else to fascinate us about the universe and the cosmos and Earth. But we don't. There's a boundary to how much we know. And beyond that boundary, we are ignorant. And that's great, because that allows us to push that boundary every year, every day forward until we understand more and more and more. And the hope is that eventually... In the long future, we will understand essentially everything there is to understand about the universe. That's the goal of physics. But today, we have a very definite boundary, and it doesn't come about this boundary be just because, oh, uh, maybe we weren't creative enough or maybe we weren't smart enough to figure it out. But a lot of times, this boundary of knowledge is there because we just have no way to measure what's going on on the other side of that boundary. So, so we, you, um, we, I think you mentioned in the break, or, or maybe before the break, the Big Bang, okay, mm -hmm. or the singularity inside of a black hole. Okay? The reason we don't know what's going on there is because we cannot probe and measure what's going on at the singularity of a black hole. We cannot measure what's going on at the Big Bang. Um, why can't we measure what's going on at a singularity? Well, first of all, because black holes are sort of far away from us, mm -hmm. and our technology is not advanced enough to take us to one in a reasonable amount of time. Number two, even if we were close to a black hole and we went into the black hole with our little measuring equipment and measured what was going on in the singularity, then how do you suggest we get that information out of the black hole? <laughs> Because once inside, nothing comes out. I mean, you can't send a light signal or a radio wave or radio transmission or a television transmission out of inside a black hole. It just The radiation, the signal won't reach the outside. So in some sense, science, when there's no communication, there's no science. So therefore, science ends inside of a black hole. <laughs> it's, so, so that's a fundamental limitation until we get around that. Um, we are forced to come up with other creative ways mm -hmm. to, to try to understand what's going on uh, in these very deep and dark places of the universe. In my very limited understanding of physics, and I'm just going to throw this out there and you can tell me <laughs> very quickly why this is completely wrong. <laughs> we can't go all the way back to the Big Bang, and we can't go into uh, the singularity of the black hole or into a black hole because... Time did not exist until the Big Bang. So we can get right up to it, but you can't go to the actual Big Bang because that's the creation of time. And a black hole is the end of time. Time will no longer exist. Well... Is that, is that a fair analogy? Yeah, yeah, so that's a very Western view of yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very linear, mm -hmm. okay? So, so the truth is we don't understand the Big Bang enough to be able to say what's going on at the Big Bang. And we don't understand a singularity well enough to be able to say what's going on at a singularity. In principle, this infinite energies and infinite pressures and nonsensical times that you calculate with the mathematics at a singularity or at a Big Bang are just an artifact of our physics knowledge being limited. If we had a theory, a unified theory, that could combine general relativity, the theories of gravity and the cosmos, with the theories of quantum mechanics, okay, then that unified theory would be able to explain what's going on at the singularity, and we would probably find that, for example, at the center of a black hole, 
there is no infinite density or infinite pressure. There is a very large density and a very large pressure, but quantum effects prevent that energy from diverging, from becoming infinite. It's just we don't have a theory to really uh, use to explain that. So until we find a theory like that, then we have to call it a singularity, knowing in the back of our minds that it probably will get resolved once we figure out a better theory that unifies um, the f different phenomena we observe. But, you know, then you ask, uh, you ask another question. So why is, why is it important? Like, why, why does it matter to continue to understand <laughs> right. what's going on at a singularity? Like, that's really not going to change my life, right? Yeah. I, what, what, okay, a singularity <laughs> is this. Uh, well, yeah, is it, does it affect the price of milk? <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, um, Einstein um, was not really concerned with those things in, in the early 1900s. And, and you could have asked him the same question in, like, 1910 or, mm -hmm. or even 1903 or 1902 before he concocted special relativity. It's like, why are you thinking about time? Because he was thinking about time. He was thinking, hmm, maybe this idea of absolute time is not quite right. Maybe time is more like what musicians think of as time. Time, perhaps, is flexible. Maybe I can stretch time. Maybe I can compress time. And out of his thinkings about time, which, of course, at that point had absolutely zero application in life, came the theory of, of, general, of special relativity and then general relativity. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because of those uh, theories and because of the development of clocks, of ever trying to get better at measuring time, at measuring what a second is, and a microsecond, and a nanosecond, and a sub-nanosecond, okay? Um, through, uh, you know, atomic clocks and so on, is that today we have equipment that's accurate enough to measure the position between us and a satellite that's in orbit. And they were like, why do we care about where a satellite is in orbit? Aha! Excellent question, Chris. <laughs> well, uh, well, no, because I was formulating the answer is because I have GPS on my phone. Exactly. You have GPS <laughs> on your phone. And you know your phone's a receiver. It's yes. a GPS receiver. Actually, it doesn't send signals. What right. happens is there are like 24 satellites in orbit. Mm -hmm. Okay, And these 24 satellites are... Uh, actually, they're not in a geosynchronous orbit like most people think, but it doesn't matter. They have some period of 12 hours. But anyway, so there's 24 satellites up in orbit around Earth. And at every point in time, anywhere on Earth you are at, uh, you can see roughly four of these satellites, okay? And these satellites are constantly transmitting signals to Earth. So what your phone does is it picks these signals up. It says, aha, I just detected a signal from a satellite. It was coming from there, and it sends two signals so that you can calculate the amount of time it takes for the signal to get to you. And you can do this for the, all four satellites. And by carefully measuring with your device the amount of time it takes for the signal to get to you, you can triangulate, essentially, or trilaterate, mm -hmm. and find your position uh, relative to, you know, the satellites mm -hmm. and relative to Earth, okay? Um, it, it turns out, however, that you need very accurate clocks, right? That's why, on top of the satellites, there's atomic clocks. There's mm -hmm. cesium-133 clocks. So that time can be kept very, very accurately. But on top of that, it turns out you have to account for the corrections of special and general relativity. Okay? Mm -hmm. Special relativity says that if something is moving very, very fast, then the clocks tick at a slower rate. Okay? Time dilates. Mm -hmm. um, satellites, do you know how fast satellites travel? The GPS satellites? Um, I do not. They travel at... 8,700 miles per hour. That's fast. That's super <laughs> fast, okay? And because of that, time ticks at 7,200 nanoseconds slower per day relative to clocks on Earth, okay? 7,200 nanoseconds. Okay, mm -hmm. a nanosecond is one part in 10 to the 9 seconds, so overall, that's a few microseconds, it's, or 72 microseconds. It's not that big. But it can have a huge effect on where you are on Earth, on the calculations that your you know, phone does to figure out where you are on Earth. And general relativity also has an effect, because Einstein also predicted that if you are close to a gravitational body, if gravity is strong, then time also dilates. Okay? Mm -hmm. And do you know how far away from the surface of the Earth the satellites are? Uh, 26 miles. 20,000 kilometers. Okay, uh, so 10K is six miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so 
huge height. Mm -hmm. So the satellites up there feel less gravity. Remember, we talked about this last week, mm -hmm. than things on Earth. So clocks that are in orbit, because of feeling less of a gravitation, uh, gravitational force, mm -hmm. tick faster than clocks on Earth. And they, click, they tick faster by, you know, something like 45,000 uh, nanoseconds per day or 46,000 nanoseconds per day. So in combination, uh, special relativity and general relativity make you tick at different rates. There is a, 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 an offset due to gravity and due to the motion of bodies of like 40,000 nanoseconds per day. And if you did not account for a defacing of 40,000 nanoseconds per day, mm -hmm. your GPS device would be off within two minutes. Like you could say, oh, I am at my porch right now in Bozeman. And then a week later, you could check your phone again and it would tell you that you're in Denver. Mm -hmm. And that would not be very useful now, would it? Imagine you're in a plane that uses GPS and it's trying to find where the landing uh, you know, strip is. That's sort of, it's important to know where things are within a few meters. And if you don't take into account these physical effects of dilation and contraction of time, which comes from fundamental physics, which didn't have an application when it was invented, but it does now, then planes, for example, will not be able to fly blind and we would not be able to find our favorite Chinese restaurant on a Sunday night. Super important. Well, thank you, physics. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Nico, unfortunately, we're, we're way over time. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll do this again next week. We will. Thank you very much, Chris.